Hello, everyone. Just, uh, just as promised, what you are about to see is a presentation that I gave in San Jose, San Francisco, and Berkeley, California over the last three days. The real intent of this presentation, as requested by the meetup host, was, you know, come tell your story, um, but, but also tailor it for a couple of key topics that they felt were important. First and foremost, uh, the leaders of the meetup wanted to make sure that the Bay Area investors knew that there's a lot of risk in the market. Uh, you see there's a lot of Bay Area investors that are being courted by out-of-town syndications. Uh, they're being um, called to other markets where houses are fifteen, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. And many of the silicon investors are frankly being taken advantage of, right? Uh, I do think this, this is true across the country. Uh, I'm just sharing you with you the setup that I was given, uh, again, for this Bay Area real estate meetup. In addition to that, uh, they, they wanted to really highlight that single-family homes are an okay goal, right? This is now becoming a consistent theme. Uh, first, with the presentation we did in Richmond, Virginia, uh, it was the, the same goal. Then in the Bay Area, uh, the discussion was around, um, you know, you don't have to go buy a hundred or a thousand or, or any of these kinds of units. So that's kind of the intent. Uh, I do offer something at the end, which I consider to be a special gift. Um, if you want to fast forward, I'm sure it's like minute 45 or 50. It's one of the last three or four slides, but I'd ask you to pay, pay attention to this. This is, I'm releasing this on Friday, which might make it a great listen over the weekend. Uh, I do expect this to be about an hour. Uh, these were, this was a two and a half hour presentation when I was giving it to the audience because I requested interaction, right? I wanted a lot of questions. So uh, we, I think I answered somewhere between 50 and uh, 80 questions during each presentation. So as you're watching this, if you have questions, leave them in the comments below. Uh, if you don't know, uh, I interact and answer every question. I'm the only one that has access to this account. <coughs> so I will gladly do my best to respond to each and every question. I really do hope there are more comments <laughs> excuse me, on this video than anything else I have done. Uh, in addition, I do something called subscriber questions. So if you like what the content is of this video, hit that subscribe button, and then that gives you the right to ask questions. And uh, I will likely create a video answering your questions. So in the end, I hope you enjoy this video. Again, the setup is help protect investors from being scammed, help them understand that having a one rental at a time mindset is an okay goal. So that's kind of the setup. And with that, why don't we get started? <coughs> All right, so let's, uh, let's expand this out. Sorry, it'll be a long presentation, so I will be drinking my coffee. So again, I chose to set this up knowing the intention of the presentation to really highlight the three kind of stages uh, that I believe there are in buy and hold uh, property. Uh, this is not a discussion about flipping or wholesaling. This is about being a buy and hold landlord. And we will touch on lots of different topics. Uh, we will touch on mistakes and errors and, and all kinds of things. So with that, why don't we get started? But before we do that, uh, again, something I wanted everyone in the audience to know is you can follow me lots of different ways. Uh, I create daily original content on my YouTube channel, which you may be listening to now, or you may be listening to this on my podcast, um, which either way is awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, and also on Instagram, uh, everything I do is one rental at a time. I have the website, one rental at a time.com, uh, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, all that stuff. So again, lots of ways to follow me. And of course, on the right side of the screen is the cover from my book. I'm very proud of that. Uh, several thousand copies already sold, was recommended by Forbes uh, as one of the top 15 books you have to read before getting started, which was quite the honor. It's, it's on that list with such things like Rich Dad, Poor Dad, uh, which you will see me give full credit to in a few minutes here. So again, pretty, pretty cool. 
then the next thing that's pretty awesome, this took, this honestly took longer than I was hoping for and was far more tedious than I had expected, but well worth it uh, in the end, is we have just released uh, one rental at a time on Audible. So if you choose to listen to your books, uh, you now have that flexibility. Uh, if you're listening on the podcast and you're uh, always wanted to read one rental at a time, but Audible is your way, congratulations, it is there. So. Um, one Rental at a Time is now on all platforms. It's on paperback, Kindle, and Audible. So um, never thought this would happen, but it's, it's pretty cool to know that uh, it's out there and growing. Lastly, if you have read the book or listened to it on Audible, I need help from you. Uh, I'm a self-published author, no pr production house behind me, one-man show. Uh, the best thing you could do for me as a thank you is to go in and leave a five-star review. It, it could be very simple, it could be a great book, or it could be as long as you want, just highlighting where it may have helped you. So if I could ask you to do one, one thing for me, I give stuff away every day for free, uh, could you please go to Amazon or Audible, or both, if you have both, and leave a five-star review. It's the only thing I can do to help increase the algorithm and hopefully get this book in front of more and more people. That would be, that would be really wonderful of you. Thank you very much. So this is what we're going to go through. Uh, first thing, uh, I wanted to make sure the audience, again, remember I was speaking to Silicon Valley uh, folks, San Jose, San Francisco, and Berkeley, California. I wanted them to know I was one of them, right? I had a tech job. I worked at places like Quantum and Sun Micro and Mercury Interactive and HP and, and Splunk. Uh, it was important for them to see uh, that, you know, I was like them. I lived where they live. I understand our ridiculous housing market. Uh, I understand our commutes. I understand what it's like to be a Silicon Valley folk. So uh, I needed, it was important, I thought, for them to understand who uh, we were uh, so that they would know and, and listen to the story. <laughs> we talk about stage one, uh, which for us was 2002 to 2007. It started with reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad and ended with seven properties, eight doors, right? Seven houses and a duplex. No, six houses and a duplex, sorry. I always get that wrong. Um, but that was important. And then we talk about phase two, which is interesting because it starts with near the peak, uh, how we survived it, where we went from there. Um, you know, all of those things will be discussed. And then what happened in stage three, where financial independence is achieved, what do you do or what did we do uh, and things that become available to you. Uh, I do talk about, you know, again, I put one slide up specifically about areas where I see Silicon Valley people being targeted. And really, again, I say Silicon Valley because that's the audience that I was speaking with. But really, these are, these are areas that everyone in the country is being uh, potentially offered. And I think anytime there's a hot, can't miss opportunity, uh, we need to be careful. And, uh, you know, it's something that I kind of pick up on when, when everybody is running one direction. I want to make sure that we are um, you know, trying to be uh, good stewards and, and help save people from expensive mistakes. I think I say this four or five times in this presentation, so forgive me if it becomes repetitive, but I believe it is absolutely okay for everyone listening to this to have a simple goal of getting to four to eight, maybe 10 single family homes. Um, I think that changes your life. Uh, I think for some of you, 10 rental properties has you being financially free. <laughs> but even you only get four, uh, what's wrong with having a better financial future? What is wrong with somebody buying you an asset, you know, at least 70% of your assets? So uh, I really am pushing back against the mindset of you have to buy 100 units or you are a failure, right? There are too many people out there talking about if you're not buying 100 units, you're a failure. And that is, that is horrible advice. Most people will change their financial future with four simple rental houses. And we need, to, we need to appreciate that fact. Sure, having 100 units is fun to say, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't have to be the goal when you start. Um, again, very, very keen because I was asked by the meetup host to talk about this. I wanted everybody in the audience to know that they are prey. Uh, there are people uh, across the country that are preying on Silicon Valley folks because they are perceived to have money, um, whether it's stocks or options or RSUs or bonuses or whatever, and that they need to be careful, right? The, you're being preyed on because you're perceived to have money and no time, uh, so you are being offered some 
interesting opportunities that aren't really vetted or true true things. So uh, it was very important uh, that the meetup post that I talk about stuff like that. And I, of course, will share my market thesis. If you watch this channel, you realize that I talk to you every day. It kind of evolves as I'm you know, seeing more and more things and more and more discussions. Uh, but I wanted the audience to know what we are doing in the market today because we um, we're continuing to grow. Uh, and I have a plan for the next four or five years, and I share that in this presentation. So about us, real quick, if you've watched this channel a lot, some of this will be repetitive, but um, you know, I, have to, I have to level set the audience. Uh, it's funny, in the audience, I think I talked between 60 and 80 people, and in each room, only two to four people have read the book, one rental at a time. So clearly, I need some help marketing this and, and people recommending it, so uh, I need to do a better job of that. Uh, so again, we were burned out stock market investors. You know, we made 100 grand, lost 100 grand in the stock market. It was very, very painful. Uh, we were also living paycheck to paycheck. Uh, we were spending everything that came in. Uh, we had no thoughts uh, about the future. We were enjoying life to the fullest. And then Rich Dad, Poor Dad comes along and changes our life, changes my mindset, realizes that, you know what, there is this thing called cash flow. Nobody in my family had ever had rental homes, so I didn't know anything about them. Uh, that was really a game-changing uh, book for me. I've read it no less than 20 times. But how do you get started, right? I never found that in a book. The book talks about a condo in Portland, I think, and another condo in Honolulu. One for Kim, one for Robert. Uh, but it really didn't paint the journey. Uh, that's why I created One Rental at a Time is that compliment to Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I wanted people to see what, what was possible over a 15-year journey. Uh, again, my hometown market of the Bay Area um, didn't work. It's too expensive. Uh, you know, every book I read back in the early 2000s talked about investing 30 minutes from home. It didn't work for me, so I was stuck. We ended up finding a market two and a half hours away. Uh, we pulled out a California map and drew some circles. Out of state was not an option for me. Uh, I traveled for a living on airplanes and had no interest in getting on airplanes for my weekends. Uh, so it was definitely a constraint uh, of ours was to drive there. Um, again, that's a five-hour day just to see one property. So it's, it's quite the commitment, but uh, something we've done well over 100 times now. Uh, and we uh, thoroughly enjoyed our investing time in Fresno. Uh, it should be known that we, uh, we don't know anyone. We've never been there. No, in a, no family owned rentals. We didn't have a head start. We didn't know any, you know, just... We, we, we were like everybody in the audience, right? We knew nothing. We only knew that we wanted to be landlords, right? We wanted a rental property, uh, but we didn't uh, have a head start. Uh, we did buy our first property uh, in Fresno. Uh, we actually drove down, saw a bunch, but they were not available. And then we finally saw one that was, and we wrote up an offer. Uh, again, didn't know any better, so we offered list price. We didn't know any better. We, off we put 20% down. We didn't know any better, right? So again, we did we did it. We got one. Uh, the story is not great. I've done the story on Norris Drive lots of times. Let's just say it starts with we did everything right, credit check, reference check, all of that. Uh, the tenants who move in end up getting divorced two weeks into the property. Wife takes off. Husband um, doesn't like that very much, d destroys our property. Uh, again, we're invested in California. So after that first month of non-payment, uh, three-day notice, all of that, we have to go through evictions. So it took about 75 days to get them out. Uh, so again, we had what, two and a half months of no rent. Uh, and uh, we had to pay an attorney a thousand bucks. And oh, by the way, he destroyed the property uh, to the tune of 15 grand, uh, something we had spent a long time looking for, getting, celebrating. We had to go back and spend another $15,000. The story does get better from there. Uh, you know, that same property had another tenant move in uh, who never left, never late. Uh, and then we ultimately sold it in ex or exchanged it, 1031 exchanged it into a multifamily. Uh, but again, that was, that was very trying times. Uh, I truly hope this never happens to you. I certainly hope it doesn't happen to you on your first rental because that experience could kill you uh, or at least could cause you not to go forward. Uh, I'm still amazed that we decided to keep moving uh, and, and swallow that bitter pill, uh, but it, I, it, it did work out. But again, I don't wish that on anyone for their first experience. And this saved us. Uh, I had always thought we were 100% on board together. 
Uh, and thankfully, this experience vetted that, and we were truly on the same page together. So um, that is really what saved us because nobody was blaming anybody. We just fixed it and moved on. So I believe uh, when you are starting out that you as the investor, you as the person with the money, uh, you need to be able to answer one question before you invest a single dollar, right? Don't write an offer. Don't do anything until you can answer this one question. What is a bad, average, good, or great deal in your chosen market, your chosen asset type? Uh, and if you need help with that, stay tuned for the special gift here at the end. But that is the question that you need to be able to answer. <laughs> if you can't intelligently talk about what is a bad, average, good, or great deal in your market, you haven't looked enough. You are, you're risking things if you, don't, if you can't answer that question. 99% uh, of the stuff that is listed and available in public markets are bad or average deals. Um, that's just the reality, which means that there's 1% of deals that are going to be good or great. Uh, the other thing that should be apparent is we retired, we, were, we became financially independent on deals available in the multiple listing service. Uh, we did buy, in full disclosure, two properties uh, before financial independence, not uh, out of the multiple listing service. So uh, they were quote unquote off market. Uh, one was on auction.com. Uh, and then the other was directly from a bank who uh, came and found me on a property next door and asked if I wanted to buy his. So other than those two, uh, everything we did was available uh, to everyone on the market and everything we bought, you could have bought theoretically um, because it was available on Realtor or Redfin or like um, uh, system or, or application. <clears throat> we didn't have any systems, no direct marketing, no network, nobody feeding us deals, none of those things. Uh, we were just somebody th that got up and looked at the market every day, looked at the market every day for 10 years. And um, it takes that kind of rigor to really learn your market. The one skill I had besides being kind of myopically focused on looking every day was how to compare deals. Uh, I was able to very quickly understand the importance of comparing deals and understanding that you don't have to pay list price. And I wanted to know how hard my money was working and all of those things. Uh, again, uh, I give all of this stuff away in my course. Uh, you'll see the gift at the end. But that's, you know, that's the one thing, right? I, I don't think there's any, anything new in real estate investing. It's all out there. Uh, I just put a laser focus on understanding what a deal is in your market and help people understand how I learned how to do that. We did, we did know what parts of town to avoid. Uh, this is very important, right? There are parts of the market where you will see ridiculous returns. And this goes back to the hot market idea. Uh, you may be seeing 10, 12, 14% returns in other cities and other states. I promise you when unemployment goes from three and a half to seven, the reality of your fake spreadsheet is going to blow up and you are going to be in a ton of pain. Uh, there are other cities and usually in the central part of the U.S. Uh, that is attracting California investors uh, because of the perceived double digit return. Uh, it might work today, uh, but it won't work long term uh, as uh, unemployment doubles. Uh, it is going to get rough, uh, and I feel for you. Uh, it did take us uh, just about seven years to exit phase one. We'll talk about phase two here in a moment. Uh, but really the key uh, for us at exiting phase one was we couldn't buy our next property. If you remember our journey, it starts long before the real estate crash. We started on the other side when it was started building up. And we were, getting, we were looking for the ninth property or the eighth property, right? Ninth unit. And I couldn't find anything. It, it was very discouraging. <laughs> what we had bought for roughly 100 grand was now going for over 250. The problem was the rent was the same. And none of my spreadsheets could make that rent payment on that purchase price profitable, right? There was no cash flow, uh, and we were not going to do negative cash flow deals. So uh, we were stuck until we went to a real estate meetup, like the ones that we did in San Jose, San Francisco, and Berkeley, where we heard an investor talk about small multifamilies, and that was life-changing for us, uh, and hence began our phase two. 
So again, the keys to phase two in our mind is you're reusing capital that you deployed in phase one, right? That could be down payment or equity or mortgage pay down. But basically you're going back to capital already deployed, getting it again and reusing it. Um, for us that, you know, for simply that could be cash out refinances. Uh, something that I want to put here is make sure when you do a cash out refi that your property is still positive cash flow. Uh, I made the mistake the first time of thinking a bank would be conservative, which it wasn't. And uh, I turned a positive cash flow property into an alligator, hence the no alligator that is in my book, that image. It's on the back of one of my hoodies. Uh, because again, don't create alligators. Those are what can kill you. Uh, those will eat bags full of money. And uh, it is not a pleasant experience. The big thing for us is we did lots of 1031 exchanges. Uh, we sold that first house, moved the equity into five units. We sold the next house, moved it into 13. We sold the next one, moved into 18. So what we did for about a year, right before the market crashed, is we, moved, we sold all of our houses. If you wanna overpay for something I own, I am happy to sell it to you because I can move the equity somewhere else. Uh, and this is a big deal for us, and what really keyed our phase two. Uh, market cycle, there is no question. Sometimes people call me lucky. Sometimes people call me good at what I do. It, it doesn't matter either way. It's just the story is the story. And, um, you know, the market helped us, right? There was appreciation. Uh, there was bad lending going on, which forced even more appreciation. And instead of getting stuck in that hyper inflation or appreciation, we got out and we took the equity that was there and we moved it into multifamily. Uh, when you, when you want to overpay, I'm willing to sell, uh, back, you know, in, in 2007, that was houses, uh, in 2020, that's apartments. And if you want to overpay for some of the apartments that I own that are, that are not great performers, I, I will sell them to you. Uh, and just like the houses, they will be back on the market in three to five years and, uh, maybe I'll buy them back. <coughs> Uh, the herd mentality is real. Uh, I just wanted to make the audience see that. Um, you know, when you are, when you're going to real estate meetups that maybe had 20 people in it back in 2010 or 12, and now in 2020, there's a hundred or 200. Uh, you have to realize that um, the herd is real and, and they're going to, they're going to push prices up. They're going to make deals really, really skinny. Uh, so you need to be careful. You've got to be able to learn to compare a house with an apartment building. Um, there's a lot of social media out there trying to make a commercial or apartment building seem more complex. Uh, I don't believe that's the case. It, it is all about money uh, and how hard your money is working. Yes, there are more units. Yes, the numbers are bigger. Uh, but as far as deal evaluation, I personally believe you should do it the same way. Uh, and you should only be looking for where your money is working the hardest. Uh, in my market of choice today, uh, that means single family homes are the best investments. I do want you to understand something. Again, I told you this was going to be talked about a few times. I think I said four. So here's number two. If you just get to four to eight to 10 single family homes, um, I want to shake your hand, applaud you. Uh, you are fundamentally changing your family's future. Uh, you're having an asset that someone else is buying for you. Uh, that should not be seen as a bad thing. Um, again, you win. You don't have to go to phase two. You don't have to go to apartments. You don't have to 1031 exchange. <clears throat> if you want to simplify your life and just manage houses, that's awesome. Bigger is not always better. Uh, I've been very clear on my thoughts on multifamily today. Um, it was bigger. It was better for 15 years. Don't get me wrong. Um, those, if you were doing multifamily five, 10 years ago, you're crushing it. Uh, but today, when everybody's chasing that hot topic, not the place to be. Uh, please do not believe uh, folks in social media that says everyone is pushing apartment, apartments. If you're buying 100 units or less, you're an idiot or a loser. Uh, I think that's horrible advice. Uh, I do realize that there are sometimes unicorns holding four-leaf clovers next to gold bags. Uh, so there could be some deals out there still, uh, but there, there are not a lot of them. Uh, the deals are very skinny today. Uh, I see them all the time, so be careful. Again, I want it to be said, if you got four, eight, 10 single family homes, you win. Congratulations. 
There's some surprises going to 80 units. Again, I want people to realize it's not all sunshine and rainbows. I think people are talking about bigger is better, like it's suddenly everything's great. In fact, I had a lot of downside with going to 80 units. Uh, turnover increases. You know, my average tenure in houses are about eight years. Suddenly, my average tenure in a unit was two years. That'll do, that'll mess with your cash flow. Uh, we saw expenses on houses go from less than 20% to apartments being over 40%. So again, when I see an apartment at 25% expenses, uh, I often tell the person, are you a liar or are you an idiot? Which one do you want? I don't care. Um, I have not been able to run an apartment building uh, for less than 40% expenses. Drama increases. Uh, when you have so many people living so close together, you get phone calls and headaches about parking, about cooking smells, about kids screaming, babies crying, dogs doing what dogs do. Uh, it is, um, it's like high school or whatever, right? It's just, there's so many people interacting in such a close confinement. It's, it's tough. Rent frequency of increases is higher because again, your turnover is higher. Uh, the increments are much, much smaller. Uh, but yeah, you can, as units turn and all of that, you can raise 15, 10, 20 bucks. Uh, rent increases are pretty common. Cash flow does increase, uh, both top and bottom line, right? So gross rents increase, obviously, uh, but net net cash flow increases, assuming you buy the building appropriately. Um, but also your capex spending and your repairs also go up. Pretty much everything goes up. I'm not confused. While I'm talking somewhat negative about multifamily today, uh, it is only because of the prices today. Uh, I give full credit of our 8 to 80 transition keying our financial freedom. There is no question it was a great help. Um, so again, I believe multifamily is awesome. I love providing affordable homes for folks. Uh, but again, it, um, it's, it's tough in a market where prices are nearly unrealistic. Uh, I believe uh, single family homes are much easier to manage, especially for full-time employees. Again, remember the audience and sitting in front of me. Uh, we're often working 60, 70, 80 hours a week, having family responsibilities so they don't have time. Uh, so the, the key here is if you're going to self-manage, uh, you might want to self-manage homes versus apartments. Uh, I would never try to self-manage apartment units. Just not a good idea. Here's some realities that people don't really appreciate. There's this, um, this notion that um, when the economy turns, it's easier to stay in apartments than houses. That's wrong. Uh, at least my history does not say that. Uh, there's a difference between occupancy and effective occupancy. Occupancy is how many heartbeats you have in your units. Effective occupancy is how many heartbeats and how many checks you have for those. And in a downturn, uh, I have found that apartment um, people that live in apartments live closer to the paycheck to paycheck. They often need both uh, adults working to afford it. And uh, if one of them loses their job, they're making a choice between food and shelter. Uh, it is very likely that they will leave. They will probably go move in with family. Uh, that's why houses, uh, people will fight tooth and nail to stay in a house. They often invite their family members from apartments to come move into their house. Uh, very, very common. Uh, so we have seen effective occupancy drop significantly in apartments, and it doesn't really move in houses. Uh, so please understand that. The other thing that's going to happen when unemployment rises is cap rates are going to go up, right? We, we, I was talking in the Bay Area where somebody said the average cap rate was 3.8%, which is nuts. I believe if unemployment in the economy turns, your 3.8 is going to go to 6 which if you get stuck in a refinance is going to hurt you because the value of the property has dropped. You may actually have to bring money to the table. Uh, you will absolutely have move-in specials, half-off rents, things like that. Turnover, again, is what really kills landlords. Uh, so do what you can to make turnovers cheaper. Uh, this is what I do in every unit. I don't care if it's a 500-square-foot, one-bedroom apartment or a 2,000-square-foot house. I put uh, laminate flooring, uh, LVT, I guess they call it now, uh, in all the living spaces except bedrooms, which get carpet, and anywhere there's water, meaning kitchen and bath, they get tile. Uh, so again, 
Uh, that's something I do. I do undermount sinks. Yes, it's a little more expensive, but I want to remove seams where there could be water leaks. I do granite countertops. It's a little more expensive, but they last three, four, five, six tenants. Um, and again, tile where there's water, so tile in the bathroom. And I do put semi-gloss on all the walls. It just makes it easier and easier to clean. Again, you don't have to move to phase two. If you just want to get four rentals and call it a day, awesome. If you want to get eight, awesome, or 10, awesome. Nobody says you have to go to phase two. If you get to the end of phase one and you're happy, congratulations. Uh, bigger is not always better. Uh, apartments are much, much harder to manage. Don't, in my experience, don't try to self-manage apartments. It's not worth it. Uh, expenses go up substantially. Uh, market cycles can be a no-brainer. Uh, what I mean by this is sometimes people want to overpay. Uh, back in 07, people wanted to op overpay for houses because of the lending environment. So I exchanged. Today, people want to overpay for apartments, so we have sold. Uh, cash flow does increase if you move at the right time and structure the deal appropriately. Um, you know, there will be times where houses are overvalued, just like there's times where multifamily is overvalued. So phase three, that really starts when financial freedom is achieved, right? When uh, the key to financial freedom that most people don't want to admit is it means living a modest life. It is not about the Rolls Royce, the private jet, or the fancy watches. For most of us, financial freedom is achieved by living a modest life, driving a used car. Um, living in the same home you've been in for 25 years, not upgrading anything. Live below your means, keep your expenses low, and financial freedom is far easier. If you increase your lifestyle to match your income, financial freedom will prove elusive. Uh, Olivia was able to get out in 2014. I left in 18. Uh, one of the questions we got at each event was, how'd, how'd you know? Uh, the fact is we took Olivia's paycheck from 2013 uh, for example, and put it in a separate account and just ran the whole year like that money didn't exist. Uh, and, that, and the answer was, did we ever need it? And the answer was no. Uh, so that proved that uh, you know, we didn't need that income and it created a reserve for us uh, as a nice little plus. We reviewed our portfolio uh, when we both got out. Uh, we started to rejuggle debt and equity. We levered up on some multifamily, paid off some single family homes. So our cash flow stayed roughly the same, uh, but our debt structure is different now. Uh, we started to sell. Uh, at each event, we talked about selling uh, apartment buildings that were uh, tough to manage because, again, when the economy is good, the, the Excel spreadsheet looks good. Uh, so we gladly sold a couple of apartment buildings that are going to be proved to be very tough to manage uh, when the economy turns. Um, you know, we need to decide what to do next. Hence, I created this <coughs> YouTube channel, which gives me something to do every day. Um, wrote a book, all of that stuff, help people where I can. Uh, you do not have to keep growing. Uh, we have certainly decided to keep growing, uh, but we are certainly focused on what, what it means to be happy each and every day. Uh, we have structured our life uh, to keep living modestly, uh, but to be happy. Uh, if you want to keep growing, do yourself a favor and take the assets that you have that you become financially free on, put them somewhere else, uh, and then uh, try your new thing. Don't risk what you're free on by opening a restaurant and then blowing up. Uh, that, that would be a shame. Again, always remember it should be about being happy. So some of the things that are hot and can't miss that make me nervous, again, something that the uh, leaders of the meetup asked me to talk about. First off, I wanted to talk about 2008, where everybody was a flipper because Countrywide and IndyMac were giving out these ridiculous loans. It, financing was easy, so everybody wanted to buy a house. Um, so that led to a horrible crash, as we all know. Uh, but today, this was important for the audience to hear, it's not financing is easy, it's equity, right? There are lots of people out there, general partners, GPs, trying to take your money as LPs. They are promising sweet nothings about preferred returns and five-year holds and blah, blah, blah. And they're saying, oh, look at me. Uh, when in reality, they started doing this five years ago, it was really easy. Anybody could have done it five years ago. Today, it's ridiculous with the pricing uh, in place. So uh, I really made, made people clear that um, 
they need to be extra careful and do extra due diligence if somebody's saying be an LP. Because as you will see in my closing slide, uh, I plan to buy a bunch of multifamily from, uh, from syndicators that blow up because uh, when cap rates go up, their refis are going to be a problem and they're going to be forced to sell. Another thing is, uh, it, we've heard this on this channel, right? We've had many people on one rental at a time talk about the Burr strategy. They read the book, got really, really excited, tried it, and it blew up in their face. They lost money. People stole from them. The appraisals came back because a purchase money appraisal and a refi appraisal are different values. It just is. One's far more conservative. Um, so, I, you know, don't think it is as easy as it is in the book. Uh, of course, we had to talk about the Michigan houses. How many of us haven't heard about an 8, 10, or 15K Michigan house? Come buy it, pay cash, less than your car payment, or less than a car, sorry, less than the cost of a car, I'll buy three. It's never this easy, folks. Be careful. Again, it was very important for me to tell the audience that you are perceived to be the big fat whale. You're the one with no cat. You're the one with cash and no time. So people are coming, trying to take your money. So be very, very careful. Uh, I do have this saying, I think I've said it once, this will be the last time. Yes, there are still unicorns holding four leaf clovers standing next to a pot of gold. If you find one of those, you might have a deal. If you catch my drift, it is really, really hard today. Again, 48, 48 properties you win. You do not have to buy 100 units. Don't chase, don't rush. There's always another deal. Uh, lots of investors get excited. They have this pile of money in their pocket. They just went IPO and they've got to deploy it before they spend it. Um, that is often a recipe for disaster. Again, you have to learn this skill. This is something I put on each and every investor. You have to learn what a bad, average, good, and great deal are. This is so important. This is, And the other thing about this is once you learn how to do it in one market, you can transfer it. It, this buying and buying, being a landlord and no, understanding your market is a skill that you can use into your 80s. Uh, it's not, it doesn't deteriorate with age. Um, so again, it's, it's an imperative skill uh, to learn and something I'm focused on helping people understand how to do it. Uh, bigger is better. It actually worked for 15 years. Uh, it just doesn't work today. Uh, the reason I pick four investment loans is my goal for most people is it's easy to get financing today. I've had buyers get something in the low fours. Uh, I actually had one person get a 3.8. Uh, that's just crazy lending. When I started, my first rate, I think, was seven and an eight. Uh, so be, be, just realize and appreciate where you're at special times and go get that 30-year money. And again, if you get four rental homes, you're going to have somebody else buy 70% of your asset. That asset is protected from inflation. It's a hedge against the dollar. Uh, it offers tax advantages. It's, it's just nothing like owning conservatively financed cash flow positive rental homes. So what are we doing now? Uh, first and foremost, we are still growing. I promise you to highlight what we're doing today. We are actually aggressively looking to add houses. I believe houses are undervalued today uh, because um, everybody's looking at multifamily. And what we are going to do is we are going to set up to do 1031 exchanges. Uh, and again, the whole story of how we did this the first time is in my book. It's on Amazon, Kindle, and Audible. Uh, but we're going to do it again. Uh, it may start in 2024, may start in 26, don't know. Uh, but we are likely going to be buying a lot more apartment units when the you know, the next, when the bubble bursts in multifamily and we're going to use appreciating single family homes to do it. We're selling overpriced multifamily and moving into houses. We sold an apartment building and did a 1031 exchange into 15 houses uh, from one seller last year, for example. Uh, we did start flipping properties. Uh, if you follow this channel, you know, I take slumlords and turn them into pride of ownership. We don't need to go over that. Uh, we don't flip like we don't, flip like HGTV. We flip for landlords. Uh, everything we buy, we have sold to people, most people watching this channel, which is pretty cool. Um, you know, it's fun to see people buy their first rental property and get started. That's, that's kind of a cool feeling. Uh, we've done 40 plus flips. We did 18 in 2018. We did 22 in 2019. We've done two already this year. So um, 
lots of fun stuff going on. We occasionally level private money, but in reality, we're not doing a lot of this anymore. Um, we have our own deals are hard to find. Uh, but again, it's something we have done and will do if, if, if the situation arises. Um, we are teaching new investors how to get to four to eight. It's really a big deal for me to help people realize that if you just have a goal of four, that's okay. Uh, again, I believe the only question you have to answer is what is a bad, average, good, or great deal in your chosen market? Uh, and if you don't know how to do that, uh, there will be a gift and a link uh, you know, at the closing of this because I, I, that's what I help people understand. There's nothing wrong with conservative financing, living below your means, learning your market, and being happy. That's a pretty nice life. And that's what I hope, I hope for you. I am trying to be unique. I am trying to attract additional deals, create deal flow. I'm very proud to say that we've opened the hub in Fresno. Uh, it's at 1567 North Van Ness. You can go ahead and read this flyer. Uh, I am trying to go direct to sellers. So while I did grow and retire on deals in the multiple listing service, uh, now I am going to uh, sellers. And this is an example of a postcard I sent to landlords and basically said, hey, uh, come check us out. This is a resource center at the hub. Uh, I have staffed that with licensed agents, licensed general contractors, wholesalers, flippers, Airbnb person. And uh, you can call that number there, Adam, at 559-785-0696. If you want to come down and meet somebody, uh, go ahead. Just call them and, and arrange to meet someone down there. It's very important for me to have a footprint in, at, in Fresno where Silicon Valley investors, SoCal investors, out-of-state investors can come and really check out the great city of Fresno. Uh, and I'm really happy that this flyer stands out and looks very different than anything I have seen from other wholesalers. So how to follow me. Uh, everything I do is one rental at a time. We have daily original content on YouTube, daily original content on Instagram. Uh, my podcast, One Rental at a Time, is uploaded every, uh, every Saturday. Uh, so that is, there's no original content on the podcast. What happens is uh, somebody takes the video file uh, from YouTube, strips out the video, and then uploads the audio. Every, every podcast or every video over five minutes gets uploaded to the podcast. Um, we just crossed 110,000 listens, which is pretty awesome on the podcast. Uh, we do have the book. I think the book One Rental at a Time needs to be read by everyone who read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Rich Dad, Poor Dad changes your mindset, but it doesn't tell you how. One Rental at a Time tells you how. How did somebody do it? How did somebody take the mental mind shift of, of Rich Dad, Poor Dad and go and create a, a, a portfolio that ultimately led to financial freedom? Uh, the book's on Audible. If you'd rather listen, uh, that is totally okay. Uh, we do have an online course. <coughs> We do have this special gift. My online course is how to get started one rental at a time. This is what I mean. It teaches you right up front how to learn your market, how to get focused, how to have daily execution, how to compare deals. It also gives you access to me and my private Facebook group that is only open to students. If you buy this course, which uh, is listed at $199, um, you get the ability to get added to this course and get and can ask me questions and show me your homework, which comes from the course. It is very cool. And again, you'll have a gift just in a minute. Uh, I do have two public websites. Uh, I do have the one that I've talked about already, one rental at a time dot com. Uh, it is out there uh, and available. Uh, it is getting, um, a, you know, my videos, some videos are being converted to blog posts. If you'd rather read uh, those, uh, they're there as well. And then I did just create the hubfresno.com uh, for folks that want to check out what we're doing at the hub. So in the end, financial freedom is absolutely possible. It just takes time. Uh, a better financial future is step one and a wonderful goal for everyone. Bigger isn't always better and it's never easier. Market cycles are real. The mania is real. Asset prices can get out of whack. Uh, I have seen can't miss markets before, and those are dangerous. When the mania is running, you're running at a cliff. I'm trying to get out of the way. Value add multifamily is not where I want to start playing today. 
Uh, it has been wildly successful for us in the past. It is just not the place we want to be today. Nothing wrong with solid single family homes, right? Buy below the median, put on some cheap 30 year money. You'll be very, very happy. And again, you're not ready to buy until you can answer this question. What's bad, average, good, or great in your market of choice? So here's my special gift, right? I've already talked about how to get started one rental at a time. It's an online course. It's offered for $199. Uh, you can get it at my website, onerentalatatime.com. Just go to that URL and go. I think you scroll down a little bit. Um, it helps you answer this question. It helps you compare deals, right? I show you how I compare houses with apartments, uh, it cash on cash or yield. Uh, I want to give you a, a special coupon code. Uh, this coupon code will save you $20. So what used to cost $199, right? You've been listening to me now for probably 45 minutes. Uh, thank you if you're still listening. Um, book 20 is the coupon code. It will save you $20. So it only cost you $179. And then I'll be notified and then I'll send you an email asking you for your home address or your office address if you want. I don't care. But I'll mail you an autographed copy of my book, which people like, right? I'll sign it. I have the same inscription I put in all of them. Uh, but hopefully that's seen as a cool thing. So for $179, uh, you get the course, which will help you understand what is a bad, average, good, or great. Uh, and you also get an autographed book, which hopefully is seen as a cool thing. In the end, that's what I have. Uh, I believe uh, one ritual at a time is the right thing to do. I've created this message. I create daily original content because I want to create belief. I want to create confidence, focused, and then informed execution. So hopefully you enjoyed that. Again, when I gave this presentation live, it had very interactive and lots of questions. If you watch this and you have questions, let's make this interactive. Leave questions in the comments below. I'll do my best to interact quickly so maybe we can get a lot of comments going. Uh, if you have additional questions, just leave them below and we'll have some fun together. If you're still watching this, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, make sure you hit the thumbs up, subscribe, and of course, have a wonderful day.